Hi, my name is Kara Slade. I'm a priest here in the Diocese of New Jersey serving in Princeton, and I'm also a canon theologian in the Diocese of New Jersey. We're here um, to speak about sin, grace, and redemption uh, for one of our videos on foundations of faith. I'm Fleming Rutledge, a priest of the church for 45 years and more, many years of parish ministry, but now essentially given up to uh, a, preach, a vocation of preaching and some teaching and leading conferences and retreats. So the theme of this conversation is sin, grace, and redemption, uh, but I'd like to actually take those topics in reverse order. Um, I'd like to start with God's action towards us in Christ as a theologian who's important to both of us, um, says we can only understand the human condition in light of the cross. So what happened on the cross and why is that important? Well, I'd like to start by saying that the journey that is so important for Christians is not our journey to God, but God's journey to us. And um, I love what Karl Barth calls that, the journey of the Son of God into the far country, based on the story of the prodigal son. And the reason I say that, the reason I like to emphasize that, is that it is not something that we do towards God that secures our redemption. It is what God has already done without our stirring, without our knowledge, without our help, without our, com our comprehension or participation. Participation comes later, but the original meaning of our redemption is sourced in God's prior action toward us. And for that action of God toward us to be a hideous execution, public execution, is what makes Christianity unique. There isn't any other story like this. There are other stories about gods who died and rose again every year in this cycle of the seasons. But there is no other story that tells of God willingly entering into human life so as to die horribly. And that's what I'm always interested in figuring out. Why so horrible? Why such a horrible death? Why not some neat, clean form of death? Or drifting off somehow spiritually into the Empyrean. Why such a dreadful, shameful, inhumane form of death? That's the question I think all Christians should ask. And the answer comes with the preaching and embracing of the significance of what God did on the cross. It's what God is doing on the cross that is important. It's not what we are feeling about what God is doing. It's what God is doing. It has an objective quality. And this is important because there's so much emphasis on the way we're supposed to be feeling. Um, people are asked to contemplate the cross and meditate about the cross and come to the foot of the cross and on Good Friday, uh -huh. um, acknowledge it in some way, even kiss it in, uh, at times. But all of this is meaningless unless it is founded in the knowledge that God has acted uh -huh. here. Uh -huh. And I don't think that's sufficiently understood or preached. God is doing something. What is he doing? That's the next question. Right, and so, and what is he doing? So um, there's a lot of debate around how people um, you know, generate models of what happens on the cross, what God does on the cross. And we call this um, debates over um, atonement theories, um, which is a little bit of a misnomer, right? Because um, you take the whole scriptural witness together um, and it doesn't easily map onto one theory. Um, but why is it important um, to look at the cross in terms of both 
um, of both some kind of sacrifice of substitution, but also as as a kind of a victory, a, a horrible victory, but a victory nonetheless. Well, the reason it's so important to think of it in these various ways is that that's the way the New Testament presents it. And at the risk of sounding self-promoting, I have written a 600-page book about all of these, or most, if not all, of the themes and motifs that the New Testament uses in order to in order to show us, reveal to us what God has done. And it, ha it can't be put into a few sentences. I'm not sure that it can be put into propositional sentences at all, and that's the reason that the Bible, the New Testament particularly, depending upon the old in so many ways, uses pictures, images, uh, themes. It's more, it's more like poetry than it is like propositions. Mm -hmm. I really uh, would love to see us get away from the idea that the Bible is full of propositions or uh, principles. Mm -hmm. I hear a lot about biblical principles. Um, I don't hear that in the Episcopal Church so much, but um, we need to understand that the life, the, the incarnation, the life, the ministry, the passion, the death, the resurrection and ascension of our Lord is a story more than it is theological doctrines. We have to have doctrines because we have to mark out the boundaries in which Christian thinkers operate, otherwise we will wander away from the Christian story altogether. But the fact that the Christian story is told in metaphors and images is central to our understanding what, Christ, what God in Christ has done for us. And so we have images like sacrifice, ransom, descent into hell, which I like to emphasize, actually. Um, we have imagery like Exodus and, well, Passover and Exodus, a very important motif concerning the crucifixion and resurrection, which are a single event. The problem in the Episcopal Church, as I see it, all the mainline churches, but particularly the Episcopal Church in which I was raised, is that a great animosity has grown up about the idea that in the cross Jesus is substituting himself for us. I am not sure why there is this animosity, but it has something to do with an overemphasis on um, a kind of programmatic interpretation of this theme in the 19th century. But without this theme of Christ doing this in my place, we do lose a lot of the personal dimension that I think is so important in Christian commitment, Christian understanding, Christian, or Christian personal engagement with our Lord. I grew up with grandmothers and aunts who spoke about Jesus as though he was a very real person right there with us. And I think that all Christians need to have that sense that I am personally involved with what Jesus has done for me. This is not just a transaction that's mm -hmm. occurring. Right. As some of the best Holy Week hymns put it, it is for me not in an abstract way, but in a very deep and personal way. But at the same time, and I want to emphasize this, at the same time, it is also an objective victory on the cross over death and hell. And in this world today, where we seem to be victims of powers that are greater than any human attempt to corral them. It is very important to acknowledge that the Christian 
preaching of the cross is not just about me personally or you personally, but about the cosmic event of victory in Christ over the powers of sin and death. So those are the two major overarching um, images that I would like to emphasize, that I think the scripture emphasizes. I'm trying to show that this, well, never mind what I'm trying to show. I think the New Testament gives us these two overarching themes or motifs in which we can come to understand mm -hmm. what God has done on the cross. Atonement and victory. Those are the two themes. Right, and so um, that when you talk about um, sin and death as powers, I think that actually leads us back into what um, you were just mentioning about Christ's descent into hell. Um, this is something that and sometimes when people say the Apostles' Creed, because that line appears in the Apostles' Creed, they're not sure what to do with it. They're not sure how to think about it. So say a little bit more about um, what some people would call the, the harrowing of hell or, or Christ's descent. Uh, what happens on Holy Saturday? Well, this is a very controversial part of the creed. And I've noticed, because I travel around the churches, not just the Episcopal churches, but all the churches um, in all denominations, very few now say he descended into hell, even though that is in the Apostles' Creed, but it was a late addition to the Apostles' Creed, and it is not as easily defended as the other parts of the Apostles' Creed. Um, I personally believe that it is essential um, and that we should recover it and say it. It's still in the, it's in the morning prayer, mm -hmm. part of our prayer book, morning and evening prayer. Uh, but a lot of churches have, have changed it to he descended to the dead. I don't think that does it. I think we have so much hell in the world today. True, God forsaken, apparently, hellish circumstances for millions of people. And there are private hells. There are many private hells, people who commit suicide, people whose depression is so profound that they truly believe themselves abandoned by God. Jesus has been there. And I think that's one of the most important themes that we can possibly emphasize. There is no darkness so deep that he has not been there and in the resurrection has overcome it. And if we don't maintain that line, he descended into hell, I think we have lost something at the very heart of what it is to proclaim the victory of Christ. And I think it's essential for us to be willing to look at that. I have um, read a great many things in recent years as I prepared to write my book about, written by secular people, about the need for language to talk about hell and Satan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These, uh, they refer to them as symbols, which is okay. Um, I don't think of either hell or Satan in a literalistic way, but I think we are meant as scriptural people to understand that there is a third power at work in the world. It's not just God and human beings, it's God and human beings and the adversary, whom we call Satan, whom Jesus called Satan. And it is not an accident that Jesus, in the Gospel of Mark particularly, the first, in the Gospel of Mark, the first thing Jesus does is to perform an exorcism. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That is the sign of who he is. And the devils recognize, the demons recognize him. No one else, when no one else does. So um, in teaching and preaching and understanding what God has done for us in the cross, we need to remember that there's a real enemy. There is a real enemy set against all that God purposes to do. And in Christ, in the crucifixion specifically, this enemy is overcome. The question then, of course, becomes, well, then why is it still so terrible? That's another question. Right. But <clears throat> we must proclaim this first and then struggle with the why does it go on question. Thank you.
So from, um, from the cross, I think now we move to question of our salvation and um, the question of what saves us. Is it something that God does? Is it something that we do? Is it a little of both? This was a famous question of the Reformation, right? Recently, um, in a, among my colleagues, you are and my colleagues, I think, um, in the theological world, and there are groups in that world as there are in any uh, human enterprise. People take positions and argue with one another, and that's where most of our most uh, fruitful work comes, is in lining up these arguments. Positions. In the tradition in which I have been trained, increasingly scholars have begun to say that the agency question is paramount. Agency meaning who, whose power is at work? Whose initiative is this? Who is initiating the work of salvation? Who is carrying out the work of salvation? Who is uh, directing the culmination and conclusion of salvation? And in Christian theology, the answer to every one of those questions is God. I love the collect in our prayer book. All our works begun, continued, and ended, ended in thee. thee. That is a phrase worth remembering because it so clearly shows that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, continues to work in us the work of Christ on the cross. It's not something that God once did and now we are supposed to take it up and carry it forward. God is carrying it forward. It is begun, continued, and ended in him. Our role, and this is where participation comes in, our role is to participate in what God has doing, is doing, or God, what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. And we want to be found on the right side of his doing. But it is he who is carrying forward his great plan. We are taken up into that by the Spirit. And that's important because otherwise we get into the position where we think, well, God is not really able to finish his work unless we help him. And that is such a wide misunderstanding and it's as old as the faith and will go on forever until the next until the second coming we will have this argument about agency but I believe that many Christians over the centuries have understood that there is nothing more freeing than knowing that God is at work and that we may join in we join with God in his work we do not contribute to it in the sense that he can't get along without us. That's a mistake that people make all the time. That's the old God helps those who help themselves right. mistake. Which is not actually in the Bible, y'all. So. Very recently, I heard, listened to a tape of a very prominent Episcopal layman, very, very prominent Episcopal layman in a big church. And he was giving a speech, and he began it by saying, we all know God helps those who help themselves. And no one corrected him. Right. It just went on from there. And that is, uh, it does need to be said that's antithetical to the gospel. We are able to help ourselves only insofar as God has already done this work, this uh, work of Christ on the cross. So this finally leads us to the question of sin. Um, we don't like to talk about sin. Um, it's something that maybe polite people don't want to talk about. And yet I think each one of us is deeply aware of how wrong we can go in our own lives and how wrong the world seems to go. Um, what does it mean to say that human beings are sinners in light of the cross? Well, first of all, I think it means 
that we need to understand that sin is a power, not individual misdeeds. We have a very limited understanding, most of us, of sin. We think of sin as being maybe adultery, it may, may be fraud, um, slapping your child in anger, those kinds of things, sin. Um, those are specific sinful actions. But sin, understood from the great perspective of all the apostles, the prophets and apostles, sin is a power with capital P. A lot of Pauline scholars have taken to capitalizing the word sin, death, and power in order to show that they are agencies in themselves, not agencies to rival God ever. But nevertheless, entities with purpose, determination, and focus on defeating God's purposes. Tolkien is so good at this in The Lord of the Rings. He shows how there is this power set over against all that is good in the world. And unless this power is overcome, it will continue to rampage and do all this fatal damage. If we can understand, and this is what I try to do in my own teaching, if we can understand that sin is a power over which we as human beings have no control, only God has the power to defeat and conquer sin, whether, whether in the last day or in each tiny victory in each human heart whether it's the greater or the lesser. In each case, it is God who ultimately wins the victory. As an, if an alcoholic becomes sober, it is God working through that alcoholic. It is not because the alcoholic has superior willpower. It is God delivering him or her, and AA understands this. The mistake of identifying sin with sins in the plural, prevents us from understanding what God has accomplished for us on the cross. If we whittle down sin into sins, it's a much reduced way of understanding what we're up against. I do think people, in, through preaching, through being taught and in sermons and in classes and in discussions and in Bible study groups. I really believe in Bible study groups. People can learn that sin is an overarching power over which human beings have no ultimate control whatsoever. Um, then we can understand that God has entered, God has entered the battlefield on our behalf. And here this military language is offensive to many people, but I think that's a little sentimental because there's a battle. There's a battle in human life. There's a battle in the cosmos. <laughs> Just look at our planet, endangered the way it is. I was looking at the pictures of uh, the astronauts looking back from the moon and seeing this gorgeous marble, blue and white, and thinking we are destroying our planet. And we're not doing that because we're bad people specifically. We're doing it because we are in bondage to our own appetites and to the um, hold that Satan, if you will, the devil, the adversary, I like the term, the adversary, the adversary has upon human systems. The more we try to manage our lives, the more we create damage to the planet. And this is an example of the cycle that sin has created for us. And so what God is doing, surely, is waking us up to the damage that we're doing. This is God's work to wake us up to the damage. It is God's work to wake up Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Facebook started out as the dream of Mark Zuckerberg, uh -huh. that, that we were going to have peace and harmony <laughs> and, and communication throughout the world. It was going to be a wonderful thing. And look what's happened. Mm -hmm. This is such a classic example of the way that the adversary moves in on our very best motives. And I mean that quite seriously, mm -hmm. our very best motives. Most of the time it is good motives. Most of the time I think people do want to do the right thing. Sometimes I wonder, but most of the time I think we want to do the right thing. And we find ourselves frustrated. Things don't work out the way we meant them to. That's because of the power of sin. And to know that we have been delivered from that by God himself in the person of his son is the best news that we could ever hear. That does not answer the question of why sin still is so obviously rampant among us. Doesn't answer that question. That's another question for another time. Mm -hmm. But the promise of God is that we have already, in a very significant and real sense, been delivered from the power of sin by the death by the death of Jesus Christ. And just to say that the crucifixion shows us that God loves us is not enough. It does not take account of the battle that is being waged on the cross, an actual battle between God and the adversary. Over our heads, as it were, our participation in that is to hound him to death. That's our participation. It is only because of his death, his shameful, humiliating, excruciating, gruesome, ghastly death, it is only because of that that we consider ourselves delivered from the ultimate death that is that is waged against us by sin. It's very important to understand that we're talking about powers external to the human being. I never understood that when I was a child, I don't think, but I always had a residual sense that there was a real something with agency that was evil. And I think that most thinking people today recognize that. There's something going on among human beings that is not just one bad person here and another bad person there. And once we begin to see that, then we can understand why the crucifixion itself was so terrible. Because Jesus, as the hymn says, was crucified by sin for me. I think that says it in a very simple sentence of crucified by sin for me. Five words. Christ was crucified by sin. That's why it was such a terrible death. The worst that could be imagined. Crucified by sin for me. It puts it all together. You have the cosmic dimension when we say crucified by sin, because that sin understood as power. Mm -hmm. But then for me, me personally, you personally, you personally. So one final question that I have um, is to talk about um, a famous debate of the early church um, between Augustine of Hippo and Pelagius um, over the role of the depth of to which human sin affects um, our capacity to, to do what's good, to do what's right. Um, and this is a debate that you can still see bubbling up in the ways that Christians and indeed the broader culture think about um, what's possible for human beings to do. So you wanna talk a little bit about Augustine versus Pelagius and why Pelagianism is bad news? I can speak about this very personally because at a particular point in my life, I began to realize that I could never gain complete mastery over certain traits of mine that give me and others a great deal of trouble. I can gain insight into them, which is very important. I'd like to emphasize insight. Mm -hmm. That's a term I learned from a psychoanalyst, but insight into oneself is part of what God does in us and for us. 
to show us what our real state is, what our real condition is. And, and to, to learn to laugh about it is part of it. <laughs> to recognize that we are not ever going to be masters of our faith, but that Christ is master of our faith. What could be better news than that? I can use an example. Of, it sounds trivial, but procrastination, you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Procrastination has hounded me all my life. It causes me no end of trouble. It causes a great deal of trouble for people that I work with and people whom I live with. It makes me anxious. It makes me angry. It makes me selfish. And I've never been able to get the better of it. I never have. That's one of my lesser sins, but it's one that I'm willing to talk about. <laughs> I think it is marvelously freeing to know that we will never gain complete mastery of any of our personal defects. But God can work in us, not only can, but does. God works in us to overcome and reshape and reframe and redirect even our sinful traits to himself and to his purposes. And to know that someday I will not procrastinate anymore and I won't even think about it anymore because all will be perfected in God mm -hmm. is the most wonderful thing that I could possibly know. Original sin is hard to understand because it's been such a despised term and has been vilified for so many centuries, especially in the modern era. It just means that we cannot, because of whatever it was that happened in the primordial history of humanity, whatever that was, we call it Adam and Eve, but whatever it was that threw us off the track and made us no longer able in and of ourselves to follow God. Whatever that was is so deep, deeply implanted in a, all of us that we can't get the best of it. That's what original sin means. It means that from birth, we are conflicted beings. And Augustine talks about this as wonderfully as anyone ever did. Isn't it wonderful that Augustine has been retranslated and is becoming rediscovered again and again and again in every generation? It's miraculous. Augustine, 1,600 years ago, 1,700 years ago, understood these things in ways that everyone can understand today. And he understood that Pelagius project took away our freedom because it made us anxious to acquire merit. I've just finished reading Rudyard Kipling's masterpiece, Kim. It is really a wonderful book. But the main character besides Kim, who is the main character, is the old the Tibetan Lama. And I must say, I got very tired over the course of the book, although I adored the book. But the, the Lama talks about acquiring merit all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what most religion is based on, is acquiring merit. Mm -hmm. Pelagius believed that we could do that. And Augustine knew that we were, as captives of sin, unable to do that, and yet, that God in us not only can do it, but is doing it. And we can't defeat God's purposes for good. God's purposes for good in us is stronger than my inability to get hold of my procrastination or my worst sins. And this, of course, in the end means irresistible grace with all of the complications that that brings up. But irresistible grace is an enormously important concept for Christians to understand. We can never completely defeat God's purposes. And that should give us the most wonderful sense 
of of freedom to be what God puts in front of us. I love that part of Ephesians. Every Christian should know that part by heart. I'm not sure I can even quote it by heart, but the part in Ephesians where God says, or where the apostle says, that God has prepared, these are the words of the prayer book, God has prepared good works for us to walk in. They're already out there. We're going to walk into them freely without even realizing what God is doing. If we're really seized by God, we won't even know it's God because we'll be so free. And we can't run away from God. There's, there's nowhere that we can run. Don't you love God's that poem, Hound of Heaven? Yes. We yes. cannot go, we can go down into hell, thou art there also. Absolutely. And that brings us back to the subject of hell, which appears in the form of Sheol in that psalm. I can go into the deepest parts of the sea. I can go even into Sheol, thou art there. Jesus has been there before us. There is no better, better news than that. But not just that he's gone there before us, but that he has emerged and brought Adam and Eve up with him. In victory. In complete victory. Yeah. So Easter is not just about you and I are going to go to heaven. This is about a complete victory over everything that battles against the purposes of God, including your sin and my sin, but including also the sin of the peoples of the world, not, not just other peoples, but the peoples of the United States. We can't ever be just Republicans or just Democrats because there is no place to look in human politics for the politics of God except insofar as God breaks in, breaks in and liberates peoples from their oppression. And then, of course, the oppression comes back in again, because it always does, because Satan is always out there. Sauron always reappears. But God cannot be defeated and will not be defeated. And each one of us, each one of us has a role that is given to us by God. And that can't be defeated either. Well, thank you so much, Fleming Rutledge, for this tremendous conversation. Thank you on behalf of the Diocese of New Jersey. It's been an honor to speak with you today.